Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, April 30th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. One feature in modern consumer grade firewalls that probably made the biggest difference when it comes to protecting the various devices that users are connecting to the network is NAT. Now, NAT never really meant to be a security feature, does a reasonable good job in preventing some of these random unsolicited inbound connections. Where it doesn't help at all, of course, is outbound connections. And apparently this is a problem Problem again with security cameras, in particular those that support the iLink P2P protocol. iLink P2P essentially instructs the camera to connect outbound to a specific server that is associated with that camera's manufacturer. And if you are owning one of these cameras, the only thing you need to know in order to connect back to your camera is a unique UID, which is essentially a serial number. Problem, of course, is these UIDs are predictable, so an attacker could easily scan for security cameras by connecting to a particular manufacturer's server and just essentially brute force different serial numbers. Security researcher Paul Marapis took a quick look at some of these servers and he discovered about 2 million connected devices and he was able to connect to devices just knowing their serial number. Now you still need the username and password to actually log into the camera but of course if users aren't aware that the cameras are actually exposed in this manner they may not bother setting a strong password or changing the false passwords at all. Also, the communication from the camera back to this control server is in the clear and unencrypted, so any passwords may easily be picked up in networks. So what can you do in order to protect yourself? Well, uh, the outbound traffic is on UDP port 32100. You could block this particular port outbound. Of course, turning off the camera may be a suitable way. If you're still in a warranty period, maybe just send it back to the manufacturer and get your money back. But another lesson here, of course, is always pick a unique, strong password for devices like this, even if you don't expect them to be exposed outside of your network. While this doesn't help here with the encryption and the password being sent in the clear, at least it should prevent some sort of random hacking attempts that you may otherwise be susceptible to. It looks like Windows 10 users are not as eager as expected to apply the latest October 2018 update for Windows 10, also known as version 1809. Only about a third of Windows 10 users have this applied and 63, so the other two thirds roughly are still using the April 2018 version, version 1803. Now, if you remember when the October update originally was released, there were a good number of reports of some severe problems with this particular update that may have discouraged users from actually installing it. Also, Microsoft actually blocked the install of this update to a number of users that were using some known incompatible configurations. In my opinion, one of the big issues may also be that the October update really sort of lacked a flashy kind of killer feature that typically does trigger users to install updates like this just to play around and try out this new feature. And tech support scammers apparently have found a new trick in order to convince users to call their fake 800 numbers. In this case, the attacker is actually freezing the user's browser using iframes. We've seen similar techniques before, usually with pop-up windows and the like. This one is a little bit more subtle, but appears to be still effective in just displaying the tech support number for users and making sure they can't really use their browser anymore. Of course, anybody with some basic technical knowledge will be able to recover from an attack like this. 
Windows, for example, you should always be able to close your browser from the task manager. But then again, uh, the victims of uh, these particular attacks usually aren't all that familiar with their systems. Now, just a quick update on the WebLogic attacks we talked about this weekend. Still seeing lots of attacks, of course, against WebLogic. With teaching today, I didn't really have the time to look at the logs in detail to see if any of these attacks use the new vulnerability. Also, I haven't gotten any confirmation whether or not Oracle did actually release the patch for 12.1.3. I just checked the advisory, the public advisory they published, and nothing has been updated there. And that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.